And I think uh, this debate is going to be a big fighting because this is Australian, this is Indian. So fighting is going to be very fun. Okay, I will be the chairperson, also the moderators. So before we start that, uh, first you need to look at the uh, Simon face clearly. He look pretty smart, right? And he's going to propose uh, as a proponent for the kinematics alignment. For those who don't understand clearly about the kinematic alignment, just give you an overview. This is the 3D alignment to restore the neutral alignment of the leg. Not natural, let's say, not natural, not neutral. So it means that the TPA may be a little bit uh, oblique in varus, femur also a little bit more valgus, and posterior collateral axis is a little bit internal uh, rotation in relative to the trans epic collateral axis. Then the femoral cut could go to major resection. Tibial cut is slightly wireless. And look at the opposer. He looks very angry. So maybe he need to do something to fight with Simon. And his idea, he gonna stay with the mechanical alignment. This is a 2D alignment, just outer the femoral and tibial joint line from ob obliquity to the uh, parallel to the floor or perpendicular to the bone. And this to need, need to achieve the neutral coronal alignment. So femoral cut is going to be perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur. And tibial cut is going to be uh, mechanical, uh, tibial, uh, follow the mechanical axis of the femur and perpendicular to the tibia. So now we're going to start with the first round. So big fighter, Simon, please. Thank you, Ari. I'm really pleased you uh, you introduced the topic there because you've just about um, confirmed my argument that really we should be thinking three-dimensionally about our knee replacement, not in two dimensions. That's that's I can stop now, but I won't because I've got eight minutes. So before we start about uh, total knee, who who in the audience likes unis? Show of hands. Fantastic. Again. Arguments, uh, arguments over because the uni is the ultimate kinematic knee replacement. It's a true resurfacing, it restores patient's alignment and a well done uni is not failing early due to wear or loosening. This is not a new debate. This debate's been going on for some time. Back in the 70s, John Insull, David Hungerford had similar uh, discussions around where we should be putting the knee in terms of overall alignment. Insull's uh, approach, of course, was to, to have a symmetrical distribution of contact stresses using a gap technique, aiming for a zero degree mechanical axis. And he said that it can require the alteration of an individual's pre-arthritic anatomy. Hungerford, on the other hand, preferred to go with a measured resection technique, maintaining joint alignment and position, which became known as an anatomic alignment philosophy. Kinematic philosophy is really just an evolution of that approach. Nevertheless, mechanical alignment became the dominant alignment philosophy. It ignores the pre-arthritic alignment. You aim to cut the tibia and femur at zero degrees of the mechanical axis in extension, rotate the femoral component to be parallel to the TEA and the tibia, and then balance, whatever that means, the soft tissues to create equal and flexion equal and symmetrical flexion and extension spaces. So really this is tibia driven surgery. This is cut the tibia mechanically, match everything else around it. Well what's wrong with that? Lots of papers now report dissatisfaction with mechanically aligned knee replacement. Existing dissatisfaction with current techniques independent of implants, surgeon, navigation, guides, whatever technique you use. Other papers reporting maximum Oxford scores of 34. That's not a good score to be your maximum average score. System systematic reviews expressing 20% dissatisfaction rate with knee replacement. So we've got to be doing better. The other thing that's really important thing to understand is that static alignment seen on your plane x-rays has nothing to do with dynamic tibial loading. What we're really interested in is what's actually happening when we're functional in stance phase. And we know there's a significant difference between static and functional stance phase. So why would we change? Well, this really is 
this was the game-changing paper that told us what we really already knew, but there is a significant variety of patient pre-disease alignment. These are 250 non-arthritic volunteers. Johan Bellerman's paper showed a very broad uh, distribution of alignment. The other landmark paper that we should be aware of is Eckhoff's work in defining the, the rotational axis about which the tibia flexes and extends. It's not the transepicondylar axis. It's the center of the uh, superimposed cylinders reflecting the femoral condyles. And you can see that the divergence between the transepicondylar axis in yellow and the Eckhoff axis in green is significant. So, if we're not all neutrally aligned and we don't rotate around the transepicondylar axis, we must often need soft tissue balancing or be unbalanced through the range of motion or both. And remember, John Insel said it can require the alteration of an individual's pre-arthritic anatomy. So Ari has uh, alluded to what it is. What is kinematic alignment? It's essentially aiming to correct the arthritic deformity of the limb to the constitutional, that is, pre-disease alignment of the patient. It aims to restore natural tibiofemoral articulation, alignment and soft tissue laxities and thereby limit the need for soft tissue balancing procedures. <clears throat> what it is not is, I'll oh, just put the tibia in a little bit of varus. That's really not what kinematic alignment's about. It's about reproducing the three-dimensional kinematics of the knee based upon the femoral, uh, femoral morphology. So in doing that, it aims to restore the three axes of alignment. The transverse femoral axis, that is the Eckhoff axis. The transverse femoral axis about which the patella flexes and extends. And then the longitudinal axis about which the tibia internally and externally rotates. So really, instead of tibia-driven surgery, this is femoral-driven surgery. We aim to achieve an equal distal resection, accounting for cartilage wear, and an equal posterior resection, accounting for cartilage wear. It can be done with patient-specific jigs, it can be done with modified conventional instrumentation, and it can be done with computer-navigated uh, computer protocols. These are just some quick examples of pre- and post-op images. Those patients were in four degrees of, uh, of virus. So is there any evidence for all of this? I mean, it sounds pretty nice. It's appealing in a philosophical way. Gene Dossett's paper in 2014 was really the game changer. <clears throat> he reported on 88 patients in two arms uh, mechanically aligned with conventional instruments versus kinematically aligned using the now discontinued Otis Med guides. Two year follow up. Look at the differences. His Oxford scores in the mechanical group were 33 on average and in the kinematic group were 40. Similarly, WOMAC and combined knee society scores were, showed significant, highly significant differences between kinematic and mechanical in favour of kinematic alignment. Callius's paper from Hamburg, published last year, 200 patients looking at shape match uh, PSI versus standard instrumentations with mechanical. Outcomes favoured kinematic alignment and they said that restoring the pre-morbid flexion extension axis of the knee joint leads to better overall functional results. It did, however, note that the kinematic group had more outliers and that they felt that was probably due to guide accuracy rather than, rather than uh, any other factor. Max Modo last year uh, reported on 60 patients. Both arms uh, were uh, computer navigated, kinematic versus mechanical, and they looked at the uh, weight bearing imaging. And they found that the joint line orientation and mechanical axis position was actually better in the kinematic group than the mechanical group. And they also found that knee flexion was slightly better in the kinematic group. Nevertheless, their knee society scores were the same. Uh, Young's paper from Auckland is probably the, uh, another very good paper, but it showed certainly no, uh, no difference in the PROMs at two years. Uh, there was a nice paper and importantly showed no inferiority with kinematic alignment. Uh, Yoon tried to put this all together uh, earlier this year in, in a meta-analysis and found that kinematic alignment had shorter operating time and overall better functional outcomes. 
So as was alluded to earlier, what happens to the femoral component when you do a kinematic knee? It's generally a little bit more valgus and it's more internally rotated according to the transepicondylar axis. But remember, we're not talking about aligning it to the transepicondylar axis, we're talking about alignment to Eckhoff's axis. What happens to the tibia? Well, as you'd expect, it goes into a little bit of varus, about two degrees in most pa in, uh, in Dossett's paper, and in Young's paper, it was about three degrees, with a fair spread in both groups, actually. Look, this is his mechanical group in blue. There's a fair spread of uh, tibial axis alignment, and perhaps a broader spread in the kinematic group, and you'd expect that. We've done a preliminary analysis of our first 100 uh, kinematic knees using modified instrumentation. We looked at pre- and post-op Oxford scores and post-op CT Perth protocol with a minimum six-month follow-up. We uh, performed the procedure according to the HALS technique using uh, modified conventional instruments. Our Oxford scores went from an average of 21 to 38 and a half post-op. And our mechanical axis uh, was within three degrees in 82% of cases with a slight uh, variance towards being in varus. One valgus outlier out here at eight degrees. Our tibial varus, uh, just reversing the way this graph is, appears, uh, was 82% were within three degrees of tibial uh, alignment uh, with a few outliers. So look, in summary, kinematic alignment is an evolution of an established philosophy it's sympathetic to the pre-arthritic alignment on, and soft tissue parameters. The tibia is designed to rotate around the true axis of rotation and admittedly the boundaries of the technique are yet to be fully defined. Alignment is not two-dimensional. Let's think three-dimensionally. Kinematic meta-analyses which uh, show minimal differences are actually referring to old technology, the old shape match technology. And certainly the area is ripe for further reverse uh, research. And so over to you, Ashok. Okay. The next, we're going to move to Ashok. So Ashok, you're going to show you the mechanical alignment, so how good it is. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Ari. Let me start by putting this picture up, the protagonist and the antagonist. Those of you who are cricket lovers would remember a year ago, an Australian team came to India and we won rather comprehensively. Uh, we got to return the favour back in uh, Australia in uh, November, December. Two words that uh, Simon mentioned, katka and matka. Katka sounds more like one of these mixed martial art tournaments. Matka in India is illegal gambling, so I don't know which of the two is, is the better of the two options. I'd like to start with a disclaimer, and this appears in every screen on Bollywood, which is the largest entertainment industry in the world. All statements mentioned here are not intended to hurt, offend, irritate, or malign my adversary. The purpose of this presentation is to enlighten Simon that crooked rarely stays stable if malaligned. So why is proper alignment of the knee important? Because it reduces mechanical and shear stresses on the poly, it decreases mechanical and shear stresses placed on the interface, and it balances the forces uh, transmitted through the soft tissue envelope which affects ultimately the functional outcome. So if a knee is poorly aligned, it decreases implant survivorship, that's uh, very clear. It increases poly wear, poor, poor functional outcomes and early failure which leads to component loosening. Now there are different alignments um, that are, have been described over the years, the mechanical alignment and uh, the kinematic which we are debating. There is also an adjusted mechanical alignment and anatomical alignment and a restricted uh, kinematic alignment. And then of course you have the constitutional alignment that Johann Bellemans uh, advocates quite avidly. So uh, this has been already described, the distal femoral cut is made at uh, reference to the mechanical axis, anything between 3 to 6 degrees depending on the deformity you are correcting. The tibial resection is at uh, right angles uh, to the mechanical axis and the femoral component is placed in 3 degrees of external rotation parallel to the posterior condylar line and this is done to balance the flexion and extension gaps. So this is pretty much the comprehensive uh, uh, connotation of a mechanical axe uh, technique and you would um, 
externally rotate your femoral cutting jig so that you get a balanced flexion and extension gap which is the fundamental premise of any stable total knee arthroplasty and you have different uh, rotational uh, landmarks which allow you to get your alignment so you can do one two or indeed all three of them to get your uh, optimal alignment uh, this was described more recently to undercorrect, but yet have a sort of a compromise and uh, mild, uh, slight to moderate constitutional deformities. Uh, but this does not really work in more severe deformities. Interestingly, it's not. Uh, uh, it was Hollister in 1993, and not uh, uh, the more recent authors who described the kinematic alignment depending on and he called it uh, the true uh, knee uh, resurfacing it's a 3d alignment as uh, as um, Simon alluded to they call it patient specific and ligament sparing I'd like I, I recognize that Simon is a brilliant surgeon but I dare say even he'd be hard-pressed to do this without doing soft tissue balance and I think there's this new fad of doing knee replacements we're doing osteotomies of the condyles, lateral, medial. Leave the soft tissues. If you have a quadrilateral gap, you can just cut bone where you think it should go and hope that everything falls into place. Dare I say, John and Sal would be turning in his grave. So in the kinematic alignment, the thickness of all matches the uh, thickness of the femoral component, which it does pretty much in the anatomical uh, in the mechanical alignment as well. Uh, but in the kinematically aligned knee, the femoral cut is made in one, two degrees more valgus and the tibial cut in one or two degrees more varus. And this um, uh, has been shown by Simon very elegantly. And when you look at the mechanical and the kinematic conflict, uh, the, the lines are either parallel uh, or in external rotation. And I don't think we need to dwell on that. So what are the advantages of mechanical alignment? which has uh, less stress and there are various uh, studies reported, Wang et al. in 2011, there's less stress on the polyethylene liner. And most importantly, I think this is something that is scripted in literature all over the, uh, the journals, the various tibial alignment leads to early failures. So anything which is in excess of three degrees of virus will cause medial collapse and medial poly failure because cement fails significantly under for sheer force. Um, the other advantage of mechanical alignment is decreases the lift-off motion and again in 2016 there was no lift-off motion in knees that, that were neutral uh, or even when they had 5 to 7 degrees of uh, lateral laxity. So when we look at the acceptable post-operative symptoms, uh, again uh, Nishida's uh, work in 2016 said the neutral alignment was better. Post-operative various negatively correlated with satisfaction. Now, if Simon is still not convinced about this, this implant durability, mechanical alignment leads to improved implant durability. Again, Harvey's work from 2012. What are the disadvantages? And interestingly, this is uh, uh, Howell's article in 2014. Uh, he himself alludes to the fact that uh, his technique gives higher stresses on the tibial insert. Early risk of implant failure, again 2012. Why would a man advocating a procedure talk about this 2012 repeated in 2014? What are we missing over here? Um, so increased medial compartment fear and it, we go on and on and on and most importantly we don't really have long term studies or follow up to, uh, to actually have a dogma about kinematic alignment. Oftentimes you have the uh, component in internal rotation, the femoral component, which causes a, a laterally uh, subluxed patella. If more evidence is needed, we'll go on and on and on. Uh, Jeffrey 91, you might turn around and say this is old. Uh, this is 2009, mechanical access did uh, significantly better. Uh, 2011, Mel Ritter's group, again alluding to the same fact. Literature from uh, 2017, very recent, no significant differences in gait parameters. Chetranavat's article in 2017, no difference in two-year patient reported outcomes. Want more? Meta-analysis, no significant difference in post-operative post outcomes. So if all of these are so, uh, so similar, why are we struggling to get that three degrees of various, which in 
incidentally, it's extremely hard for us to actually allude to the fact that how do you get that three degrees and not four or five? And what is your sweet spot beyond which your tibia is going to fail? And finally, the foremost objective of total knee is a durable and well-functioning joint, not necessarily one that replicates normal or the patient's native uh, condition. While the latter goal is certainly desirable, the priority of the former should never be overlooked. And this was from Adolf Lombardi's um, review article. And I'll show one more slide. Can we turn the vol volume up on this one, please? Simon, you didn't get to see the whole of it. I'd like to rest my case. I have two more slides as rebuttals. <laughs> 